Hey guys, you're watching the Best Practices Show where we take a look at the best business practices from the best dental practices all across the country. And I've got a crazy cool special treat for you. One of the hottest topics in all of dentistry. I've got the author behind it, How to Beat the Heart Attack Gene with Dr. Bradley Bell. You do not want to miss this. So do me a favor, grab a pen and hit the share button. We'll see you in a second. Hey guys, welcome back to the Best Practices Show. I am so grateful you're watching and thank you so much for uh, tuning in and all the followers. Right now we're up to 17,000 followers and over 30,000 on iTunes. Crazy cool. So thank you guys so much for being on. And one of the hottest topics that keeps coming up all the time is this book. And so I said, let's just get the author of the book. And better yet, I got him speaking at our mastery conference next year, which we'll talk about here in a second. But a couple things. We are shooting this live on Facebook. So if you have questions, feel free to add the questions to the feed and I will ask Dr. Bale himself and we'll get the answers straight from the top. And then if you're watching this later on, feel free to add questions to the feed and we'll do our best to see if we can't get you the right answers. But now I'll just, I want to say one thing about you, Dr. Bale. I just, I, you know, you and I were just this first time we've actually talked, we've talked via email, but I traveling all over dentistry and speaking in certain areas. I've been hearing about you in this book and everywhere. I mean, I, I heard about you so many times and actually one dentist had it in his bag. He's like, you got to read this. And it was like the ninth or 10th time I had heard somebody say that. And I read it and it's fantastic. And I am so crazy grateful that you're on how to beat the heart attack gene is sweeping the nation, especially in this profession. Now, if people don't know who you are, tell us a little bit about who Dr. Bale is. Yeah, I'm Dr. Bradley Bale, and I've got my medical education out of University of Kentucky. Then I migrated to Spokane, Washington to practice, and I was very fortunate to be in a cutting-edge, innovative community in terms of cardiovascular disease. And there was a cardiologist in Spokane, Dr. Paul Shields, who purchased one of the first imaging machines that could detect calcification in the coronary arteries. That was about 25 years ago. And another cardiologist from Spokane is probably the most famous cardiologist on the planet, Dr. Marcus DeWood, who published in the New England Journal of Medicine 35 years ago <laughs> that it's actually a clot that blocks the flow of blood during a heart attack. It's not the gradual buildup of cholesterol. So, and Dr. Shields was an associate of his. So I went to one of his talks and to try and make it really simple, I bought into the concept that, hey, it's important to find out if a person has disease in their arteries. If they have disease in their arteries, it doesn't really matter what the risk factors are, they could potentially have a heart attack. So if you find they have disease in the arteries by depicting calcification in the coronary arteries, uh, why don't you treat them? <laughs> so I started doing that, and my gosh, the patients that were doing that test and getting the treatment, I realized after several years, hey, none of them are having heart attacks. The ones that don't want to go that route, that we send the conventional path, and a lot of them got on a treadmill, passed it, we're told, hey, you're fine. And then, hey, a week later, they're in the hospital having a heart attack. I said, well, that, that's not working. This other way is working. So it makes sense to go look for disease in the arteries. And we have the technology to do that. So that's how it really first got started. So that was probably 20 years ago or more. <laughs> that's awesome. And you wrote this book that is a little controversial, actually, if not very controversial. And uh, I want to talk about why this is so important, because this is the number one killer and disability other. And it has been for a long time. And I think you mentioned flu beat it one year. Can you just add some context to that? Like, how big is this problem? Yeah, since 1900, 
heart attacks and strokes have been the leading cause of death and disability since 1900. So that's 117 years. The only year that wasn't true was 1918 when the flu beat it for killing people. Otherwise, it's been on the top the whole time. So, and that the exciting thing is we now live in an age where that doesn't, no longer needs to be true. We actually believe you can guarantee arterial wellness with the technology and knowledge that we now possess. So that's it. We live in an exciting time. People yeah. don't need to have a heart attack or a stroke. It's not just, oh, well, it's fate. You know, then my family is going to happen to me. That, that's not true anymore. It doesn't matter how genetically predisposed you are for a heart attack or stroke, you can beat the rap with the right information. <laughs> right. And you've produced some incredible information. Why do you think your information is so controversial? Why do you get a little bit of pushback? I'm just curious. Well, we used to get some pushback, I'd say, 10 years ago or so. We really don't seem to get much pushback anymore. The science is just too solid. Right. Uh, like looking for subclinical arterial disease as a way to determine risk. That's been verified now by several articles in the Journal of American College of Cardiology just in the last few years. Mm -hmm. So we have more and more cardiologists coming on board with us. I have a partner in Texas who's a cardiologist, a very excellent cardiologist. My partner, Dr. Amy Donine in Spokane, her newest associate is a renowned cardiologist. <laughs> who did interventions for years, but his heart is really with prevention and he's now joined her. Mm -hmm. So we really aren't getting any pushback that I'm aware of. Everything we do is grounded in peer reviewed science. Yeah. So, and the technology is just getting better and better. You said, right. Yeah. The technology is getting better and our knowledge keeps increasing. So we felt like we could prevent all the heart attacks and strokes a decade ago. Well, the job just keeps getting easier and easier. Yeah, this is awesome. Now, you feel, you know, the, the difference between arterial wellness and arterial illness, you know, you feel like there's, there's a lot of methodologies now that we can almost guarantee that we move in the direction of arterial wellness. But let's talk about a lot of these things that are so important. You know, you talk about the screening test. There's really no one test that's the silver bullet. Uh, that's the indicator. Would you agree? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, our workhorse to go investigate a patient where we don't know if they have disease, they haven't had a heart attack, they haven't had a stroke, you don't know for sure if they have disease in their arteries. Our go-to test out of the chute now is actually looking with ultrasound at the carotid artery. One advantage it has over coronary calcification, it's not dependent on calcification. Calcification is a later stage in the evolution of the disease. Usually requires somewhat of a cooling off of the disease. So with the ultrasound of the carotid, you can see the disease even if it hasn't calcified. And then you can follow it easily over time, keep looking at it every year or two if you want, see what's going on with it. But we still use coronary calcification as well because the last place in the body as a rule to get disease is a carotid. Our bodies were made to protect our brains longer than any other organ. So if we have a patient where they pass this test just fine, hey, everything looks good, and they're old enough to have some confidence in coronary calcification, we'll say, okay, we're going to do another test. We're going to look at your heart with rapid x-ray to see if you have any calcification in those coronary arteries. And it's not uncommon that they do because that's one of the first places to go. <laughs> and right. then the dentists, you know, we work closely and collaboratively with the dental community and they're in a great position with their Panorex imaging to see calcification in the carotid arteries. If you have calcification in the artery, you have disease there. And we have publications clearly showing, look, if you've got that finding, you're at higher risk to have a stroke. And we know if you're higher risk to have a stroke, you're also higher risk to have a heart attack. So we do have imaging, even mammograms, and a lot of women aren't aware of this. If you see calcification in a coronary artery, now that's different than seeing microcalcifications in the breast tissue, 
I'm talking calcification in the artery of the breast. We have publications showing, guess what? Uh, those women are higher risk for heart attack. Right. So the mammogram may be fine in terms of no indications of cancer, but if there's a finding of calcification in the mammary artery, those people have arterial disease, they have higher risk, they should be assessed thoroughly for all the potential causes of arterial disease and managed appropriately. Mm -hmm. So Absolutely. we have technology to go find the disease long before you have to prove it with a heart attack or stroke. That's, that's wonderful. Yeah, and absolutely. And if you're a dentist watching this, you know how important this subject is. And you mentioned earlier the high-risk uh, periopathogens. Can you just talk about that? Yeah, well, I think where we want it, before I actually talk about that specifically, we need to talk about there are two things that allow us to state we believe we live in an age now where we can guarantee arterial wellness. One is, again, we have technology to go find disease before you have to prove it before it's symptomatic. But the second ingredient is knowing what causes arterial disease. And what causes arterial disease is inflammation. And there are numerous causes of inflammation. The one that conventional medicine is always focused on are cholesterol and blood pressure, which certainly can cause inflammation in the artery. But there are numerous other conditions that can do it. One of the most common ones we run into all the time is periodontal disease that's caused by high-risk periodontal pathogens. And we just published a paper in Postgraduate Medicine, which is affiliated with the British Medical Journal, stating that periodontal disease due to high-risk periodontal pathogens is actually a cause of arterial disease, and it is. Mm -hmm. And that paper just got published this year. So if you have those high-risk periodontal pathogens, it can drive inflammation of the arteries, which can enhance and lead to arterial disease. And it's not uncommon. Mm -hmm. We know once somebody's 30 years of age, about half the population will have periodontal disease. Once they're my age, you know, they're over 60, uh, about 70% of people have periodontal disease. And it frequently will involve at least one or several of the five high-risk periodontal pathogens that we talked about in our paper. So right. it's a very common cause of arterial inflammation. Yeah, so. Ab absolutely. And, and um, you know, as far as cholesterol goes, you're a big fan of urging the tests of lipoprotein. You know, is, can you just speak about why that is, that's such a big, a big yeah. important Subject. We certainly look at the basic cholesterol panel, but we know there's an inherited cholesterol issue called lipoprotein A, and mm -hmm. it's found in about a third of people who end up having a heart attack or stroke, and we know it independently is a cause of arterial disease. That was proven several years ago in big genetic studies. Mm -hmm. So if you have inherited a high lipoprotein A, you are at higher risk for sure for heart attack and stroke arterial disease. And it can be easily measured. It's not expensive. And it can be treated with a vitamin. And now we have even newer medications that were just approved by the FDA in the last year or so that can also clobber the level. So it can be managed. And the few studies that we have that look at whether or not lowering it has an impact on reducing risk, certainly, guess what? Indicate, yeah, even if you lower it a little bit, you have a significant impact on the risk of heart attack and stroke. So we go beyond just a basic lipid panel. And there's a ApoB is actually a protein that's attached to all the bad cholesterol particles, including that inherited lipoprotein A problem. But ApoB, has, it's been known for decades, it way out predicts LDL cholesterol, always will, always has. And it was estimated in a paper published in the Journal of American College of Cardiology last year that if doctors actually went by ApoB instead of LDL cholesterol in this country, we could prevent half a million heart attacks over the next 10 years. 
Wow. That was being managed instead of LDL. Mm -hmm. So we measure that too. So we certainly don't ignore cholesterol. It can be a driver of inflammation. But I'll tell you this, our experience is the two conditions that are more common in terms of causing inflammation of the artery are periodontal disease, and the other is the pre-diabetic or insulin-resistant condition. Because that fires up the arteries immediately. As soon as you take the first step toward diabetes, and it may take you 20, 25 years to get there, but as soon as you make that first step towards it, we have studies clearly showing, guess what happens to the artery? You fire it up. You create inflammation in the artery. And diabetes, type 2 diabetes, is the fastest growing disease in the country. Any audience that you're in front of, we know on average about half of the people in that audience are pre-diabetic insulin resistant. And most of them don't know it. And if you know it, you can prevent it. Mm -hmm. But most people don't find out they even have it until they've crossed the line to diabetes. And then it's a little tougher to get them back on the other side. Yeah, absolutely. We, so you're we find those two conditions are more common than a cholesterol problem. That's very well, there's some inner relationship to them, like the high risk periodontal pathogens. And we pointed out in our paper, guess what it does to APOB? Increases it. <laughs> And we also know that when you're insulin resistant or pre-diabetic, you have worse cholesterol issues. So a lot of these root causes of arterial inflammation interact with each other. So we have a cartoon that depicts that. And it's the best cartoon I think we have in the Baildonine method. It has this tree. And the trunk of the tree is on fire. Flames are coming out. And then the branches of the tree are growing arterial disease. And some of the arterial disease is actually having clots form in it. So they're having a heart attack or a stroke. And underneath the trunk of that tree that's on fire are all the roots that can contribute to that fire, that inflammation. And all those roots, we have it drawn so they interconnect with each other. Like periodontal disease is related to insulin resistance. Insulin resistance is related to periodontal disease. All, both of those are related to cholesterol problems. Then psychosocial issues, sleep issues, nicotine, poor lifestyle with a bad diet or lack of exercise. So there are numerous inflammatory conditions, psoriasis. They just published Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis. That was just published a couple of days ago. They're associated with higher risk. So other infectious diseases, we know people who are hospitalized with pneumonia have a much higher risk for heart attack and stroke in the next 30 days. And they just published about two weeks ago a study clearly showing when you get the shingles, you know, that herpes zoster virus wakes up. The one that you had when you had the chicken pox, it wakes up as an adult. It can increase your risk of stroke over four times higher risk for a stroke. Wow. So, so there are numerous causes of inflammation in the artery. But the great news is in an individual patient, if the provider is properly trained, you can assess that patient for each one of these known drivers, another's gut dysbiosis, and any of those drivers of inflammation of the artery can be optimally managed. When you do that, guess what happens to the fire in the artery? It gets extinguished. Right, right. <laughs> These are miraculous. You extinguish the fire, the disease no longer is active, and it will start to shrink. And yeah. the cholesterol that's in it starts to get depleted. And the disease will stabilize. So it's, I mean, not. You know, I'm old enough now where people, some people say, well, when are you going to retire? I said, well, I think in order to retire, you have to work. Yeah. You can't call what I do work. Yeah. <laughs> and you think you can take on the biggest killer out there and beat it? That's not work, man. That's fun. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I can tell how passionate you are. It's so much fun to listen to you on any level. One of my favorite things you say is, you know, the current people in car with all respect. You, they're not detectives. You know, they're not looking. They're basically reacting 
to events that happen. And really, you're you're teaching a change of it's a mindset change. You know, we're going to be proactively looking for these indicators. Yeah. So they're so busy putting out the fires, they haven't got time to go prevent them. Is one way to look at it. Another way to look at it. Hey, when we started healthcare decades and decades ago, we didn't have the technology we have now. So we had to wait for somebody to have a heart attack, have a stroke, develop symptoms from their arterial disease, and then figure out, well, how can we deal with that? Right. And what they'd come up with, let's give them credit. It's been rather miraculous for heart attacks. Obviously, you've got bypass, you've got stents, you've got artificial hearts, you've got heart transplants. That's miraculous science, okay? It's wonderful. Yeah. But the reality is we now live in an age where you don't have to wait for the person to prove it with a heart attack or stroke or develop symptoms. Absolutely. Find out they have it beforehand and then manage them effectively and they'll never feel it. Yeah, absolutely. Now, now talk about this because you mentioned when you start to put the fires out, the actual um, composition of the cholesterol changes. Can you describe how that works? Yeah, so when the, it's no longer active disease, the body will start replacing the cholesterol that's in the disease with collagen and calcium. So it'll shrink when that happens. If you think of a boil that you might have on your skin and you, you get it treated and it cools off, it'll shrink some. Mm -hmm. The same thing will happen in the wall of the artery, which really isn't all that important because that disease really isn't obstructing anything anyway. But patients get excited about it, like with the carotid test will follow it over time, and you can see their disease is shrinking. They get all excited. Yeah. It wasn't going to block anything anyway. What could have blocked something if it got on fire enough that it, the disease underneath ruptured through into the hole where the blood's flowing, then you form a clot. That's what will block that flow of blood, and that can happen suddenly. So, <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you mentioned that most of this is, all, I mean, or maybe all of it goes back to lifestyle. You know, lifestyle is the biggest key. But then also you mentioned earlier the psychosocial pieces and the PET scanning. Can you talk about what you guys did with PET scanning and what they've, what they've seen? Yeah, we didn't do it, but it was published in American Heart Association Journal, fascinating, very sophisticated science. And it was published recently where they used the sophisticated imaging technique of PET scanning, positron immersion imaging. And mm -hmm. you probably heard of PET scanning, but it's very expensive. And they did that of the amygdala area of the brain. The amygdala area of the brain fires up when you get under stress or anxious. So they did PET scanning to see the firing up of the amygdala when somebody get under stress. Mm -hmm. Simultaneously, they use PET scanning of the spleen and the bone marrow to see how active or fired up they were. And they also did PET scanning of the aorta, the big artery that runs through the middle of us, and the carotid. And what they were able to show in that study was when people get anxious, they get stressed out, the amygdala fires up, immediately activity in the spleen and the bone marrow fire up, the arteries get inflamed, and the amygdala directly can cause inflammation in the arteries, but also indirectly through the increased activity of the bone marrow and the spleen. And they ran the study long enough that some people had heart attacks and strokes, and they were able to clearly demonstrate that amygdala activity, stress or anxiety, is an independent predictor of having a heart attack or stroke. It's all inflammation. It, it causes inflammation of the arteries. Right. But it's and cool it's that we're, we're now getting these very sophisticated studies because we've known through studies for years that, hey, there's a huge association between people who get anxious, get stressed, even depressed with increased risk for heart attack and stroke. The question was, well, how does that happen? Well, this provides some of the answer for that. Yeah. One reason it fires up the amygdala, which of course fires up the sympathetic nervous system, blah, blah, blah. But but the science is getting much more solid on all of this evidence, which it's fun. And that's another reason that I'm not mm -hmm. going to 
quit or stop. Yeah. It's too much fun riding the edge of the most current science. So uh, even though our method's been extremely effective for basically 20 years now, it's very dynamic. Mm -hmm. So we're watching for the latest studies all the time. When great science is published, we're going to translate it into use with our patients virtually the next day. So it just gets easier and easier. And then with the explosion in genetics and epigenetics, that allows us to get very personalized precision management with our patients. We've been anchored in genetics from the get-go, but our menu was pretty limited 20 years ago, basically the APOE gene. Since mm -hmm. then, it's exploded and it's still exploding. So diet is a great example of how having this genetic information allows us to give much more precise recommendations to an individual patient. As I think we're all aware that the studies continue to be published. One was just published this last week in the Journal of American College of Cardiology, again, indicating that, hey, a little bit of alcohol seems to reduce the cardiovascular risk, albeit it may increase cancer risk and may cause some other issues, maybe even with the brain in terms of heart attack and stroke, a little bit seems to reduce the risk. If you their APOE gene, you're either a two, three, or four. And if you're APOE4, when you drink alcohol, it actually makes the bad cholesterol go higher and the good cholesterol go lower. So it very well is possible it's not beneficial mm -hmm. to have alcohol if you have that gene. Now, if you're a two or a three, oh, it's great. Well, why do all the studies always show it's beneficial because APOE4s are only 20% of a population. Mm -hmm. And that's what they're looking at. It's population, not an individual patient. So if you look at a thousand patients, hey, 80% of them, a little bit of alcohol is going to be beneficial. So even if for the 20% it's detrimental, what do you think the conclusion is going to be? Mm -hmm. Oh, everybody needs to drink a little alcohol, right? Well, right. not true. And the other gene we use is haptoglobin. And if you carry haptoglobin 2 gene, you really should avoid gluten for sure. And you want to be extra good at maintaining healthy gut bacteria. Mm -hmm. So the diet needs to vary. So there'll never be, in our opinion, there'll never be a panacea diet to reduce cardiovascular disease. It needs to depend on your genetics. And as genetics continues to evolve, we feel confident there'll even be additional genes that we'll put into play when we're giving that very important dietary advice. Yeah, that's so awesome. That's, well, the, yeah. Yeah, the question always comes up whenever the alcohol thing gets introduced, how much is a little? Now, that's a joke, but it's not a joke sometimes because and so give us your thoughts on that. Yeah, no, most of these studies, when they're talking about a, a little bit, it's like eight ounces of a beer or one little smaller glass of wine or one little jigger of whiskey, say. Right. It's not a bunch. Yeah. <laughs> I just thought I would throw that at you. Right. Now, um, decoding, other things that we should be asking or thinking about, when you talk about DNA decoding, because this is very interesting, what should we be aware of in dentistry? Or what are some of the questions we should be asking ourselves when we're you know, taking good care of our patients. Yeah, well, what periodontal disease, what drives the risk with that are the germs, the pathogens that are causing the periodontal disease. So we need to know what those pathogens are. In the past, periodontal disease has been defined simply by the exam. Well, you got four millimeter pockets, five millimeter pockets. You got some bleeding on probing. Oh, your tooth's getting loose. It's getting clinically de detached. That's what defined solely periodontal disease. We now know that those findings are important. We're not saying they're not. But from our perspective, arterial wellness, we have to know, hey, what pathogens are there? Yeah. And we've got sophisticated tests that through DNA – will tell us what pathogens are involved in that periodontal disease. Then if it's any of the five high-risk pathogens that we defined in our recently published paper, hey, we don't want them there. Right. 
we want you to get rid of them if you're an oral health care provider. And I want to say this right now because it's usually the dental hygienist that goes in there and tackles that problem. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Donina and I have huge respect for the dental hygienists. They're the ones for the most part going in there and doing the hard work. Mm -hmm. They're getting rid of those pathogens. That's what, what it's all about. So we think they don't get the credit they deserve. Not yeah. only the dentists, but the dental hygienists, we believe, are saving lives. And we would take it even a step further than that. We think the whole dental staff is critical. And they all need to be on the same page with this. Because that DNA test that you can do with saliva, it runs usually somewhere around $150. So it's not pocket change, right? Right. You want to make sure that the, the staff that, that checks you in or checks you out, out is aware of all this connection and how important it is with arterial disease and triggering heart attacks and strokes. So when they see that patient checking out and they look and say, oh, my gosh, are you lucky to be here? You know, you came to our office. Our staff is aware of this connection between these high risk periodontal pathogens and arterial disease, the biggest killer out there. You're lucky to be here, and it's wonderful they did this test to see what pathogens you really have, as opposed to somebody who's uneducated, and they they don't know what's really going on. They oh, they got you for that test today, mm -hmm. too. <laughs> yeah. So the whole staff needs to be on board with the message. It's yeah. very important. But we're talking about the biggest cause of death and disability out here. So there are all sorts of other things that these high-risk pathogens are associated with, with which are important, mm -hmm. like low-term birth babies, even spontaneous abortions, failure to thrive in the uterus, potentially Alzheimer's disease, pancreatic cancer. All of those are important. But when you put them beside the importance of cardiovascular disease, heart attacks, and strokes, there's no comparison. Find me somebody who their life hasn't been touched by a heart attack or stroke. Right. That's extremely difficult to do. Mm -hmm. You know somebody. They're either in your family, a close friend, a neighbor. You know somebody. And some of these other things like pancreatic cancer, we hear about them in the news. But And I'm, again, I'm not trying to minimize the importance of them, but in terms of volume, the quantity of the disease. The number one quantity is with cardiovascular disease, arterial disease. Right. So, yeah. And not only is it the number one killer, but it's also our biggest expense. Would you agree? Oh, when it comes to healthcare, because people it, love to complain about how expensive healthcare is. Well, can you see where this is headed? No, absolutely. And they did a great study, uh, Dr. Jeff Coat was the lead author on it, published in one of our medical journals just a couple of years ago, Preventative Medicine Journal, where they had insurance data for dental and medical in over 100,000 patients. And they sorted out patients who had already had a heart attack or a stroke or they had type 2 diabetes Groups where we know their risk is huge for continued medical costs, hospitalizations, recurrent heart attacks, recurrent strokes. And some of those patients, and they all had periodontal disease, the ones that they sorted out. So there were two groups. One was, well, I want to get my periodontal disease treated. The other group, nah, I'm not going to worry about it. I'm not going to get it treated. And then they followed them for an additional four years to see if the ones who decided to have it treated, did it have an impact financially on medical costs, not dental costs, on medical costs. Right. It was huge. The heart attack type people is over a thousand dollar reduction a year. The ones who'd had a stroke, it was something like three or four thousand dollars a year reduced medical costs. The ones that had diabetes, several thousand dollars a year. That's huge. So if we put more resources into dental care, right now it's almost five percent of the total national dollars spent on health care. It's only five percent. Mm -hmm. If we raised it to 
it would have a huge impact on all of this risk from arterial disease. Yeah. Because yeah, what's I've, killing those diabetics is heart attack and stroke. <laughs> right, right. I've heard this said by so many people that 70% of health is what happens here and how yeah. you move your body. The rest of it you could really chalk up to DNA. Would you agree with that statement or disagree? Oh, I think excellent health starts with a healthy mouth. Right. There's there no question about that. And when we start talking the genetics, which, of course, we're heavily involved in, you have to realize that, yeah, whatever genes we're born with, we've got those forever. But what we're finding out, and this is exploding, too, is the whole epigenetic world. Right. You can influence, turn on, turn off those genes by what you do. And a lot of that's lifestyle. Yeah. What food you eat, how much exercise, et cetera, can have a huge influence on the expression or non-expression of genes that we're born with. Right. So again, our book, Beat the Heart Attack Gene, it doesn't matter. You can be predisposed like crazy genetically for heart attack. You don't need to have one. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> now, you mentioned more than 50% of all events can be eliminated, correct, or prevented. Let's say prevented. Um, I believe 100% of them can be. 100%, okay. Technology, yeah. With the technology, okay. Yeah, gotta, the patient's got to want to. Right. Because remember, the number one way to reduce risk is lifestyle. Right. So if somebody wants to get all this knowledge and think, well, now I'm not going to have a heart attack or stroke. I'm just going to sit her on the couch, eat bonbons, and take pop some pills. Uh, forget it. It ain't going to work. OK, they're going to have a heart attack or stroke. Yeah. You now, we yeah. can assess them and tell them what they need to do, but they've got to walk the walk. Yeah. Which so, is the hard, which is the hardest part of our profession is the behavioral components. Now, I did get a good question from our friend Deepak. He said, I did a DNA test with 23andMe. Uh, will the results contain the items you referred to? Uh, he don't he doesn't remember seeing them or should he go with a different DNA test? Is there a DNA test that you prefer? Yeah, the 23andMe, I think, may have the, quote, heart attack gene on there, which is 9P27. That one might be on there. But basically, 99% uh, of the genes we're talking about aren't on that test. Uh, there's several companies in the country that do genetic testing. The Cleveland Heart Lab has some of them. That we do. And then there's a company out of Nashville, My Genetics, M Y G E N E T X, that does basically virtually all the genetic tests that we would want from the medical side. Then there's another company called Oral DNA that has a genetic panel that involves saliva and can mm -hmm. tell a dental oral health care provider, hey, is this patient more likely to derive even greater inflammation from some of these germs and others? And that can help the oral health care provider know exactly how to manage those patients. So we do like the dentist to acquire that genetic information, but that's through an oral uh, test. And there are other oral vital out of Canada also does some of that genetic testing. Right. So, but yeah. 23 and me, no, that would no. have. Okay. Yeah. So if you're a dentist watching this, you might say, well, why is this important? It's hugely important to you and how you can influence your patients. Number one, through DNA testing. And I want to also, I just want to go back to the insulin. You mentioned insulin is the true culprit in a lot of CVDs. Um, and you're a big fan of oral glucose, um, you know, testing, T you know, tell me about that. Tell us about that. Yeah, what the, the American Diabetic Association has said for several years that a healthcare provider can simply prick the finger, look at a point of service test called the hemoglobin A1C mm -hmm. and make a determination as to whether or not that patient's pre-diabetic, quote, insulin resistant or not. And the sensitivity and specificity is not there for to use it clinically that way. You're looking at 70 to 50 percent. There have been several studies published that the oral glucose tolerance test where you challenge a pancreas with the sugar load will tell you very precisely how fatigued that pancreas is, how close they are, how far down the path toward diabetes they are. 
And several studies have been done where they've had that information and the A1C, and they've been able to determine the A1C is going to miss about half the people headed there. Now, dental providers are actually in a unique position because several years ago, a great study was published showing that if the dentist has that point of service A1C test and they can couple it with one of two clinical findings, one being if you have 25% or more of your pocket depths or five millimeter or greater and or you're missing four teeth beyond the wisdom teeth and that A1C is 5.7 to 6.5 with 92% accuracy, which that's good enough for clinical use, okay? You can tell the patient, hey, you're pre-diabetic, you're insulin resistant. Now, what the dentist needs to understand, if they don't have those findings, you can't look at the patient, oh, well, you're not pre-diabetic. You know nothing about whether or not they, they still could be, okay? It's only good on the positive end, if you understand what I'm saying. So if it's right. positive for what I said, you can look them right now and say, hey, you're pre-diabetic, go get checked out. If they don't have those findings, you cannot look at that patient. Oh, well, you got nothing to worry about. You're not pre-diabetic. No, they still could be pre-diabetic. Right. But, right. But we believe the best test, the gold standard, is to challenge that pancreas with 75 grams of glucose and look at the one and two hour sugars. And that'll tell you much more precisely if they're insulin resistant. And if so, how far down the path are they? And I think the ADA, the reason they haven't promoted that is a lot of some patients will complain about it because you mm -hmm. got to hang around the lab for two hours and drinking that 75 grams of glucose can be kind of nauseating for some people. Right. To just sit around and sip on it for an hour. I mean, you got to pretty much guzzle it down. So, but it's an important test, we believe, because insulin resistance is we believe one of the most common drivers of inflammation of the artery resting right beside periodontal disease. Mm -hmm. But actually, again, those two, in our experience, are more common drivers of arterial inflammation than cholesterol issues. Right. Right. Gosh, I have so many things. You know, I know I only get you for a certain amount of time, but one of the things that comes up is waist circumference. You have a very thought, good thought about waist circumference versus BMI. Can you talk about that? Right. The waist circumference will give you an idea of the central adiposity or how much fat is there. And that's really evil stuff. And it drives towards the insulin resistant condition. So it's much more predictive of that than looking at the BMI because somebody could have a higher BMI and yet not really have a lot of central adiposity and actually be in pretty good shape. Mm -hmm. And one of our uh, medical colleagues, he's an excellent cardiologist, really world renowned, I'd say out of the Oxner Clinic in New Orleans, Dr. Chip Levie, L-A-V-I-E. He wrote the book, The Obesity Paradox. And there is a paradox, and it's well-known and well-documented. What really matters is not so much what you weigh, it's how fit you are. Mm -hmm. So fitness trumps the fatness, but the best way to know if you have the harmful fat is the waist circumference. And in Caucasian males, we want it under 40. Mm -hmm. And in uh, Caucasian females, we want it under 36. And then ethnic groups, it does vary. Like if you're Asian, uh, we like it definitely under 36 and even 32 inches in certain ethnic populations. So, yeah. Well, I've got I've got a hundred more questions, and we're going to do another one because I have so many other things I want to go because I love every minute I get with you because you just give great perspective. But one question I do want to ask before we wrap up today and let you go is, what do you think the future looks like in this space with this conversation? What can we expect to see in the next couple of years uh, when we look down the road? Yeah, I think it's phenomenal. I think there's going to be an explosion in the want from the public to maintain, establish, maintain arterial wellness. 
what's going on with our method has been documented in two peer-reviewed studies authored by other people. It definitely works. It demands collaboration between medical and dental providers. So those boundaries have to dissolve. We have to come together. Again, good health starts with a healthy mouth. Any medical provider that doesn't realize that, they're in trouble. Mm -hmm. So Amy and I actually guarantee our work, and we would never think of doing that without having dentists that we collaborate with. And again, the hygienists that are going in there and doing really the hard work and getting rid of those pathogens that are so harmful. But we believe there's going to be an explosion of collaborative medical dental practices based on the Baildonine method mm -hmm. throughout the United States and in a short period of time internationally. We give a two-day course where we train healthcare providers, both medical and dental, and we're getting more and more foreign people coming in. Like our next course in Seattle in October, we have two cardiologists coming in from Ireland. Mm -hmm. We had two cardiologists from Ireland at our last course in Dallas, and we've had uh, healthcare providers come from Brazil, from India, et cetera. That's a global problem. That's well yeah. documented. So we believe there'll be an explosion of people providing the Baildonine method, both medical and dental, throughout the world. But in the United States specifically, we believe within two years, we can take it off the top of the list. And we actually have, once a year, we have a reunion for people who've taken our course. This year, it's in New Orleans, November 3rd and 4th. And we are having our own parade, Baldonine Method Parade, in New Orleans on the 4th, which is a Saturday. We already have a band and we have the streets will be blocked off by the policemen. We're going to march through the French Quarter, and we're going to end it at the cemetery, actually the one where Marie Laveau's buried in, and we're going to have a moment of silence for all the people buried there due to cardiovascular disease, which will be the majority of them, other than the ones that got hit by that voodoo. <laughs> Most right. of them are buried there due right. to cardiovascular disease. So we're going to do a moratorium for them, the ones buried there due to cardiovascular disease and pledge to continue marching on until we take it off the top of the list as the number one cause of death and disability. It doesn't deserve to be there. It's been there way too long. 1900, give me a break. Mm -hmm. We've got yeah. the technology and, and knowledge now to take it off the top of the list, and that's what we're going to do. We'll yeah. do it first in this country, and then we'll march on and do it throughout the world. Absolutely. Well, I, we are fully in support of your mission, love your mission, and really love, love, love your message. And so if you're watching this and you haven't read the book, this is a no-brainer. Read the book. You'll love it. And uh, check out Dr. Bale's uh, website and all the information will be posted on there. And then, Dr. Bale, you've been so gracious to join us. You're going to be one of the great speakers we're going to have at the Act Dental Mastery Summit, which is next year in all beautiful places, Napa, Napa Valley. It's been a dream of mine to create uh, the Mecca of the one time a year we do an incredible summit. And uh, in May of 2018, you're going to be one of the amazing uh, facilitators of information. So if you want to see more from this guy, join us in Napa in May of next year. So um, stick around for just a second, Dr. Bale, because we'll say goodbye to everybody else. And I can assure you we're going to have Dr. Bale back here for a ton more and keep sending your questions. So thank you guys for watching today. Um, keep sending us suggestions for things you want to see. We're going to do our best to bring it to you. And until we see you next time, keep watching the best practices show. You guys have a great evening. Okay.